Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated, kind of blurry radio talk show on computers and technology and of course turn podcasts. Everyone welcome into the program. We hope that you're doing well, you're doing okay and the camera eventually focuses out. Everyone welcome (laughs) into the program. Uh, It is Friday. Hey, I hope that you're having a great Friday and you're ready for the show today and uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a great show planned for you because every Friday we have the one, the only Mr. Ralph Bond. He is our science and technology trends correspondent here for computer america it's become a very fun role very fun segment and ladies and gentlemen we have a number of stories for you that you are going to want to hear about because you know this week has been a heck of a week you know um and i i I always like to close out with ralph because you know during during the weekdays we talk about uh you know everything from uh how ai is going to bring around the downfall of artists and how you know just the batteries are going to you know run out and apple's gonna have to switch all the thing and everything's running out and everything's just you know awful and terrible but ladies and gentlemen i promise it's not really in in, in reality things are pretty good but also ralph is here to really highlight that because his stories really have a positive bend to them so uh most of the time sometimes we talk about autonomous killing robots by the military but you know <laughs> by and large mostly we're good ladies and gentlemen computeramerica.com that's where you'll we'll find everything past shows future shows show notes links to uh, articles reviews and of course everything that we do with ralph will have a link to his website which if you're watching the video portion not only can you see ralph up there new and improved you can also see Ralph's site where of course if you scroll through the site it's a number of his segments that we do every single Friday and of course he has all the archives there as well so if you want a more Ralph focused uh, you know kind of program check out his website in, in any case ladies and gentlemen computeramerica.com let's go ahead and introduce Ralph formally so as I said before science and technology trends correspondent means that he covers Anything and everything that science and medical technology, construction, engineering, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it really does span the gamut. Uh, Ralph, welcome back onto the program. How you doing? Hey, great. I'm doing great. Great to be back. And you're so right. What we're going to do today, folks, as we do every Friday, is leave you feeling optimistic and upbeat about science and technology and its influence on our future that I hope will be better. And I think it will be if people will just do the stuff these scientists and technologists <laughs> people have come up with. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and also stop flying balloons. I guess that's also another oh, big, uh, gosh. another big thing from this week. So yeah, there, there's a lot of things you should and shouldn't do, but Ralph let's, uh, for the new folks out there, uh, of course you have our segment here, but you also have our segment over at KEX, uh, Portland, Oregon, 1190. And, uh, yeah. So on our segment, you know, it's kind of an extended version. I know that of, you know, Right. do over on the mark mason show but you know i like to think we have more fun first of all no yes to mark. i think so uh, <laughs> but also but also uh why don't you for the new listeners tell us what your goal here is with our segment sure welcome new listeners and viewers uh, i'm an aggregator of science and tech news features i find by monitoring a bunch of online news outlets and i look for stories that don't usually capture mainstream mainstream press attention and sometimes they're kind of weird and quirky but as we said a moment ago they're always i always go for the uplifting stuff i could report on a lot of negative things but Mm -hmm. let other people do that (laughs) and i'm on the lookout for news that deals with robotics medical technology sustainable energy technology transportation space physics you name it across the board and what we do what ben and i do is we crunch this down to the essential points so friends come out to computeramerica.com get today's show notes if you want to dive deeper there'll be pictures links and the notes themselves and so forth but it's a great way if you find a story that's particularly interesting you can dive much deeper with the show notes so please come out and get those show notes and with that we're ready to go <laughs> absolutely and uh of course we'll start with story number one and we'll talk a little bit about amazon zooks which i'm not very familiar with so yeah let's talk about it 
Yeah, and this was kind of interesting for me as well. Uh, so a headline here, it's a long headline, but this week, this week marks the first time in history a purpose-built autonomous robo-taxi, and here's the key, without traditional driving controls, carried passengers on open public roads. Ding, ding, ding. Very important if you're into this autonomous stuff. Although Tesla just now, I'm, I promise not to be negative, but I have to mention today in the news about Tesla having to do a recall for some of their autonomous driving software. You know, so, and, 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 you know, that's something that uh, we obviously talk a little bit about on the show yeah. already, but I have to say, Ralph, that what a way for an investor to get Tesla's attention by taking out 30 seconds out of the Super Bowl of all things and being like, mm-hmm. there's a real problem problem here what Mm -hmm. other like that is like the epitome of public shaming that was very interesting to see yeah yeah Yeah. agree and this story i picked up from engadget.com and it was covered by many other people as well and if you have the show notes and if you're watching our presentation today you can see the picture of this little thing i think it's cute as a button Mm -hmm. I, i think it's neat kind of a cool looking thing (laughs) anyway and we've got the video as well so this month amazon owned zooks i'm presuming that's how you pronounce it as well z-o-o-x started offering driverless robo taxi rides in california after receiving a testing permit from the department of motor vehicles so let's be clear this is still um kind of in his rollout phase you're not going to see these things in all your major cities right away next week no this is still kind of an incremental rollout but a significant one. So unlike the autonomous vehicles from Cruise or Waymo, Zook's vehicles are purpose-built for driverless taxi rides, so they have no steering wheel or pedals. And according to the press release on February 11, so this month, shortly after receiving the permit, Zook's conducted the quote, first run of its employee shuttle service in Foster City, California, marking the first time in history a purpose-built autonomous robo-taxi without traditional driving controls carried passengers on open public roads. So to my point about this being a incremental rollout, keep in mind that we're talking about one city right now, and we're talking about employee shuttles, okay? Not a a widespread, you can't uh, call up like an Uber and have one of these things show up at your doorstep. Not Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. But to get to the point, the company completed what it called rigorous testing with vehicles on private roads. It also ran its L3 test fleet, which was hybrid Toyota Highlanders with safety drivers as a backup human override over a million autonomous miles on data gathering missions in. Now, this I think is important. These tests were done in San Francisco, which if if you've ever driven in San Francisco, it's as almost as scary as driving in, say, uh, Boston or some of these other towns. San Francisco is a very difficult place to drive in. Las Vegas, less so. Yeah, Las Vegas less so because it's a more modern city with with pretty straightforward roads. And then Seattle. Seattle's also an interesting place to drive, and I've done all three, and it's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Let's put it at that. Okay, so so Zoox has been developing its unique pardon me unique vehicles since it launched nine years ago. I didn't nine years. I had no idea it was that around that long, and was acquired by Amazon in a one point two billion dollar merger in the summer of 2020 so again look at your calendar that's not that long ago right Mm -hmm. it's robo taxis introduced later that year are relatively tiny at 3.63 meters that's 11.9 feet long have passenger bench seats that face each other and four wheel steering and can drive in either direction and if you look at the picture ben my guess is it may be like two people on each side facing each other if i had to guess uh, offhand um, maybe three per i, I don't know i, I, okay, I would so. say it, it, it's kind of like uh, one of those train seats where you know you have two people on yeah. one side facing two other people facing on the other yeah. side. yeah 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 it didn't mention the capacity in terms of passengers anyway uh the four wheel steering, by the way, of course, no duh, makes the makes them highly maneuverable, but they can also travel at speeds of up to 75 miles per hour. And here's that's something impressive. that's really it is. And here's another impressive thing. And they can run up to 16 hours on a charge thanks to the immense 133 kilowatt hour battery packs. 
So uh, that's, you know, if you can run 16 hours and maybe if you can charge these guys overnight, if you can, um, you could have a fleet of these things going. Uh, that's pretty imp- at 75 miles an hour. That means they could be on the freeways. No problem. So we'll see. We'll yeah. see. But I do like the look of these little guys. There's just something kind of cute and appealing about these. Oh, yeah. There's a picture of the past. So it is yeah. two people per side. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah, so, so it's two people per side. And, and of course, if you go to the website, you can see more of their, you know, kind of product and stuff like that. And Oh no! Cool. Okay. Well, uh, and and uh, actually, real quick, one second. Hopefully, everything settles out. Um, did everything just crash? Hey, Ralph, can you hear me? Ladies and gentlemen, just one moment, please. A little bit of a system crash. Hopefully, Ralph, are you back? I am here. I can hear oh, you. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. That was uh, completely Oh, no worries. I don't see end. you yet, but I hear you. Yeah, yeah no, that was completely on my end and uh, a little bit of a system hiccup. Uh, something about that site really just, you know, did something to. Uh, oh, to when everything. you went off to the site. Yeah. yeah. So something about that, just my computer just did, did not agree with. So we're going to <laughs> ignore that. We'll cut. We'll cut that out. And uh, OK, yeah, good. good. Yeah, we're going to ignore all that. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to continue on. And again, check out the website. Hopefully it doesn't make your computer crash. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, and continue on. So, oh, oh actually, uh, one last thing I wanted to say about Zooks was uh, yeah. the design is very cool. And if you can kind of see the, the little image, which um, I can probably make a little little bit bigger here by let's see actually let's do this real quick for you ralph and do that 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 uh <laughs> here we go okay um recenter ralph back up so oh beautiful. there it is yep there we go okay so yeah if you can see uh the the zooks uh vehicle real quick they have the four um lidar sensors on each corner uh right. or to say one on each corner uh the right. reason that tesla got in trouble which i wanted to bring this up because you know people may be concerned about autonomous vehicles mm-hmm. um, is that tesla uses cameras you know like webcams essentially mm-hmm. uh, all mm-hmm. over their car uh and it uses it in the software tries to analyze the pictures that's coming in and you know kind of mm-hmm. do the best mm-hmm. that it can lidar is much 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 more sensitive uh it actively makes a 3d map of yes. all object uh, yes. sorry, of all objects in real time Tesla's yes. problem was that, you know, if it wasn't being captured by one of the cameras, the computer didn't really know it was there, which is why it was running over kids and yep. strollers and so on and so forth. Yes. Ralph, yes. This shouldn't have that problem. So no, just wanted to that's throw that an out excellent there. point. In fact, that should have been c- called out in the article. I'm glad you made a comment about that because I couldn't agree more. LIDAR is a much, much more interesting. And of course, the processing power needed to real time constantly mm-hmm. create those uh, 3D uh, awareness, let's say. <laughs> is pretty impressive as well i'd love to go dive into the guts of that part of the story too would be fun but yeah Yeah. neat little Uh, vehicle (laughs) when 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 google came out with theirs like that's that's why tesla was uh hailed as such a a a revolution is because they said they could do what google or you know zooks in this case or you know lidar could with webcams and that took the price from you know a 150 200 sensor and brought it down to you know fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, um, you know, for the entire vehicle. Mm-hmm. So you mm-hmm. can see where you know the incentive was there, Ralph, but the technology had not really caught up yet. So, and it was yeah. Zooks, very, very cool. And even though they threw a bunch of modifiers in it, still seeing autonomous electric taxis that could one day shuttle people around, that would be a huge improvement over you know just vehicle ownership as we know it because that's very yeah. uh, very wasteful you know to have your vehicle yeah. sitting in your driveway doing nothing for you know 16 hours a day or whatever well there you go doing. so hey, yeah and ben yeah go for uh, it. another thought comes to mind real quick uh, related to this and your comment about the lidar mm-hmm. uh, if you think about this little vehicle imagine someday a full uh, city public bus capable with loaded with these lidar things and so mm-hmm. forth and if they can really get this down to where it's basically bulletproof if you want to say that 
Uh, how wonderful, because here in the Portland, Oregon metro area where I live, uh, there's all these signs hiring now. We need drivers. We need you know, our metro public transit system is growing and they're having a hard time finding people, men and women that are going to come and uh, learn to drive and be drivers for the system. So maybe autonomous vehicles is yeah. part of the problem or part of the solution to that problem. Maybe oh, uh, it, it's certainly coming. Uh, I, I know that like in Japan and other places, uh, uh, another topic here on the show is uh, hydrogen fuel cells and yes. the buses that run off hydrogen. I, I think, you know, yes. a big concern with buses is that you know having enough battery power to run these things for an optimal amount of time uh, you know right. a little hard to do things like hydrogen yep. ralph we may see that technology come sooner rather than later so yep. definitely mm-hmm. yeah, definitely something to keep an eye on and that's story number one and again everyone sorry for the hiccup story number two <laughs> though we're going to go ahead and skip right on, on over to uh blue origin which i'll be honest of of you know spacex and a virgin galactic and you know blue origin you really don't hear as much from blue origin but glad to hear that they're smart men and women over there aren't just sitting idle yeah yeah and here's another you know amazon related kind of story too so headline here is blue origin develops system to deploy quote-unquote unlimited solar power on the moon and ben you and i've been seeing so many stories over the last year about all these technology companies uh it's there's kind of a stampede to grab part of the artemis program for the moon occupation uh, goal that we have as a country and this is fits well into that category got this from extremetech.com which is a really fun website everybody so blue origin the aerospace firm founded by amazon billionaire jeff bezos has to date focused on its new shepherd suborbital rocket however it has bigger plans including a commercial space station and a newly unveiled solar panel manufacturing system they call blue alchemist okay and the company recently announced this technology can cheaply and safely produce solar panels using only lunar regolith bringing essentially unlimited electricity to the moon so what we're talking about friends is a, a goal of someday on the moon being able to make solar panels as opposed to the very daunting and not very practical idea of transporting solar panels from earth to the moon right that's the idea So since 2021, Blue Origin claims it has been manufacturing solar panels using simulated lunar regolith and has demonstrated every step of the process. And it starts with the simulated regolith. And regolith, by the way, is just a fancy word for dirt. Okay. (laughs) Moon dirt. Moon dirt. (laughs) It starts with the simulated regolith, which Blue Origin manufactures to be chemically and mineralogically identical to what you'll find on the moon. And Blue Alchemist uses a contactless process to melt the regolith, reaching temperatures of more than 2,900 degrees Fahrenheit, hot 1600 degrees celsius for our friends in canada and elsewhere uh the, with the raw materials molten the reactor uses a process called molten regolith electrolysis to separate out iron silicon and aluminum and, and we've talked about electrolysis many times in the show uh, the whole way do you can separate elements mm-hmm. and it's fascinating that in itself is a fun thing to learn about producing high quality solar panels requires un adulterated silicon and blue origin says its process reaches more than 99.999 percent purity and that's almost like when i say to my wife i'm i'm telling you 99.99 percent (laughs) i'm telling you the truth right that's very pure (laughs) and blue alchemist (laughs) blue alchemist makes everything you need to deploy new solar panels including cover glass that protects the panels from harsh lunar conditions and transmission wires that to me frankly is the part i'm going how do you do that on the moon that's interesting but they claim they've got a formula and a way to do this so engineers at the company believe the blue alchemist panels will have a service life of about 10 years and you even if they don't last that long they say with their system imagine it on the moon you can make more of them and blue origin says this technology can scale 
indefinitely. So again, it's a great example of so many companies, so many technologies, so much research going into setting the stage for long-term occupation of the moon. We've talked about in the past all these efforts and technologies and ideas to extract oxygen and or water uh, on the moon's surface. And now we're talking about solar energy. You get all these things together. If you can pull it off, we could live on the moon virtually indefinitely. Yeah, it, it and and uh, Ralph, I, I know that you've probably felt it w- uh, with you know a lot of the news that you consume and you know kind of looking for the shows here. There's uh, you know between uh, India to a lesser extent, but between mm. America, China, and you know Russia mm-hmm. up until a couple yeah. of years, you know, a year or two ago, uh, there does seem to be some kind of appetite for another moon race. You know, for for yeah. countries to get to the moon and set up a permanent you know, kind of residence there, just like the space station, but on the moon. Uh, I really do feel like that's something that, you know, is going to happen within our lifetimes. It's, uh, oh, it's exciting. I think so. And uh, little stories like these just, you know, kind of fuel, fuel the, the, uh, the sentiment all the more. Yeah. And, and Ben, when, and you know, I'm a big fan of collaboration. Wouldn't it be a lovely, lovely world if instead of countries competing, we're going to have to be the first on the ball. <laughs> Why not hold hands intellectually, scientifically, and go as a a human family to the moon together? Oh, wow. Competition is a strong motivator. Well, that's true. I get it. I get it. I agree with you completely that I think that we could definitely do more together than separate. Um, But at the same time, there's uh, competition, I think, would would speed it along a little bit faster. It may not be as good but it will speed yeah. it along a little bit faster. So, and Hey, Good you know, point. Ralph, when, when you're up there, when you're on the moon and you only have one neighbor, you know, you're going to make friends with them because <laughs> there aren't a lot of other people out there. So I'm sure <laughs> in the end, it's all going to be, well, assuming these balloons aren't from space in, in which case, you know, lots <laughs> yes, of neighbors, right. <laughs> but we'll figure that out later. Ladies and gentlemen, story number two, story number three, let's go ahead. And Ralph has a, has, has lately for the past couple of weeks and, you know, so on and so forth, had this weird f- fixation about eating robots, and I, I I get it. We're gonna you know we're gonna find out. But uh, Ralph, story number three. Yes, yes, yes. And this one also has very personal, historic, medical interest to me personally. You know? mm-hmm. So the headline here, this comes from MIT News. Uh, please, folks, go and visit their website. It's absolutely always j- just a joy. Anyway, headline here is ingestible. Okay, ingestible sensor could help doctors pinpoint gastrointestinal difficulties, and we'll explain that more. And again, MIT News, the show notes has the link, and Ben is uh, showing you the picture and showing you the size of it. See, there's a quarter. Yeah. That's an excellent picture. Thank you. That helps give you the scale. So gastrointestinal motility, that means mobility or the ability for it to push food through your system, uh, disorders, uh, which affect about 35 million Americans, I'm surprised it's not more, to be honest with you, can incur, can occur in any part of the digestive tract, resulting in failure of food to move through the tract. Probably the most um, noticeable one is in your esophageal, your your mm-hmm. muscular tube that, that that when you swallow, you know, you're, you're, you're not aware of it, but it's doing this kind of constriction, release right. constriction as it forces things down. Anyway, uh, they are usually, these disorders are usually diagnosed using nuclear image studies or x-rays or by inserting catheters containing pressure transducers that sense contractions of the gastrointestinal tract. That contraction is what I was describing a moment ago. And again, I love collaborations. The MIT and Caltech research team wanted to come up with an alternative that would be less invasive and here's the key could be done at the patient's home wow gotta love that Uh, their idea was to develop a capsule that ben was showing you there and you can see the size based to the quarter uh the the idea was to develop a capsule that could be swallowed and then send out a signal revealing where it was in the gastrointestinal tract allowing doctors to determine what part of the tract was causing a slowdown and better determine how to treat a patient's condition so recently Engineers at MIT and Caltech announced that they demonstrated an ingestible sensors whose location can be monitored as it moves through the digestive tract. This is an advance that could help doctors more easily diagnose gastrointestinal motility disorders such as constipation, eek, gastro, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Guilty. <laughs> Many years ago, I've been on medicine for 
God, 15, 20 years. I don't know. And gastro, uh, gastroparesis. And gastroparesis, I went, oh, there's a word I don't know. So I had to define that. Gastroparesis is a condition that affects the normal spontaneous movement of muscles or mobility, motility, pardon me, in your stomach, in your stomach, not your esophageal tube, but your stomach, okay? Uh, the tiny sensor works by taking advantage of the fact that the field produced by the electromagnetic coil becomes weaker in a predictable way as the distance from the coil increases. So this is another good example, Ben, we've talked over the last several years. Uh, the field of medicine technology has become obsessed with magnetism, with yeah. magnetic manipulation of robots, magnetic this, magnetic that, magnetic because it's non-invasive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because it's non-invasive and uh, can give you a lot of controlling capabilities. So anyway, uh, going back to the story here, the magnetic sensor they developed which is small enough to fit in an in an ingestible capsule, measures the surrounding magnetic field and uses that information to calculate its distance from a coil located outside of the body. And in the new study, the researchers showed that they could use this technology to track the sensor as it moved through the, the digestive tract of large animals. So they haven't, apparently, it doesn't sound like they've tried it out on uh, humans yet, although I think... Um, there are a number of humans that could qualify yeah. as large animals, but oh well. Uh, <laughs> such a device, such a device could offer an alternative, as we were saying before, to more invasive procedures such as endoscopy, uh, which are currently used to diagnose motility disorders. And friends, I will do a public service announcement. Take it from Ralph here. Uh, many years, God, twenty some odd years ago, one day I was having. Well, let me start over. Yeah. For, Years and years, I had acid, terrible acid, heartburn, acid indigestion, right? And my father suffered from this. So I thought, oh, well, it's just a guy thing. Runs in right? the family, yeah. Yeah, runs in the family. It's a guy thing. Don't worry. And get over it and take Pepto and whatever you need to do. Tums, that kind of stuff. So one day, though, about 20 some odd years ago, having breakfast, take a swallow of cereal, and it was agony. It was stuck just like the most excruciating pain going down my esophageal tube. Mm -hmm. Went to the doctor, described my symptoms. Doctor takes a quick cursory look, slaps me around and says, you idiot, how many years have you had acid indigestion? How many years have you had, you know, a little difficulty swallowing? Stupid, you don't realize. Anyway, go and have an endoscopy procedure. They took, and I kid you not, 20 tissue samples from my esophageal tube up and down. I was so damaged. And the doctor later told me they were looking at each other while they were doing the procedure and looking at the scope and the camera. Mm -hmm. And they said, this guy's a dead man. He's really? This must be horrible cancer. Turns out they were all benign, just, you know, wounds from the acid reflux. And once I got on medication over, you know, a period of time, it all cleared up and happy, happy, joy, joy, everything's okay. But the doctor told me, he said, we don't understand how you don't, I think it was called Barrett syndrome or something, and cancer of the esophageal tube. Mm -hmm. So, friends, why am I telling you this story? Please, 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 if you have chronic acid indigestion, please talk to your doctor. Please get treatment. There's wonderful medications that can help you. Uh, please do this because it's serious and it's a it's a horrible way to go if you get Good. that. So. There's my public service announcement for this week. <laughs> good, good warning, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't, if you don't want to be slapped around by Ralph for having um, acid reflux, then you know, or your you doctor should, slap you around. Yes, or that too. Um, no, no, but I, and 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 I'll give my own little personal anecdote, and this is yeah. uh, slightly unrelated because, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when I was about six years old, and yes, six mm. is far too old to have done this. Uh, I swallowed a quarter, mm. and uh, oh my gosh, luckily oh my. I, uh, luckily I. The, the quarter was stuck kind of vertically in my windpipe, Ralph, so Ooh, you know, it didn't choke me out. So, Ooh. you know, very lucky there. Um, wow. But yeah, and, and my mom actually still has the quarter. We had to go and fly out a pediatrician, oh surgeon, whatever, you know, God. at 3 a.m. to, uh, oh you know, kind of gosh. operate on me. And she still has the quarter wow. up in my baby book. Um, so don't show her this story because she would make fun of me for, uh, to no end for something like this. All I'm saying is that stories like these, ladies and gentlemen, if, if you don't know, if you if you want to know why we're getting more and more into these, like, you know, swallow this thing, sensors, cameras, little, you know, little yep. uh, pill yep. capsule like things that can take pictures throughout your entire digestive system and, you know, potentially catch something. Uh, 
a lot of it has to do with the miniaturization, the more powerful, smaller chips that we're producing in the last couple of years that are more accessible for MIT, for instance, or other research groups. Ralph, this stuff is happening more and more because the technology is getting smaller and better as it always does. And, yep. you know, Right now, the size of a quarter, why I said that was for kids, probably this is probably still too large. But, you know, going forward, this well, is yeah. going to get smaller and smaller, better and better. And this will sure. be easier for, you know, everyone. Yeah. This will be an easier pill for everyone to swallow. So, yeah, it's, um, well, yeah, good one. Yeah, <laughs> easy very pill to impressive. swallow. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's so, cool stuff. Yeah, very impressive that MIT was able to do this, and um, yes. you know, and, and, and really the images, um, you know, just look so cool to uh, to be able to yeah. make these things. And that's um, something. The, those must be two little uh, coin batteries on, on on the back end of this. I'll thing. bet it is. Yeah, yeah and it looks yeah. like a miniature, perhaps tiny, tiny circuit board. It's a little yes. difficult to tell, but that must yes. be what's going on in there. So yeah, yeah and it, it could pass through all your entire uh, plumbing can pass this thing through yes. if you catch my drift <laughs> yes very very impressive so so i like that a lot and and i wonder if it sends a little notification to your smartphone being like coming out in you know 25 minutes be ready like i, I don't know maybe we'll uh we'll yeah have to wait that's and see. funny but there you go. Story number three. Story number four. And this is something yes. that um, you know we all, uh, you know, we at Computer America, uh, we at Computer America like to do <laughs> as well. And I'm glad that you, um, you know, found a source for this as well because yes. February it is Black History Month, and right. for Black History Month, I think that you know, for a lot of the really, really notable people in science and technology, yes. Uh, a lot of white guys, a, a, a lot of older white guys, and you know, uh, here and there, there, you know, of course, there's like the first computer programmer was a woman, and you know, there's women all over the place uh, as well. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ra Ralph, it's not, it, you know, it's not hard to argue that the most notable figures in technology are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, white men. That's even Silicon Valley still kind of has a problem with it. But I say that, and I know full well that some of the biggest advancements and most influential technologists and creators of you know what we use every single day are yeah. African American. They you know yeah. uh, really technology as we know it comes from all different backgrounds, all different sources, yeah. and African Americans yeah. have had a huge influence on what we do yeah. in in our world. Yeah. So I'm glad you have yeah. story number four, and I'll leave you to it. Yeah, no, that's good. And I'll just add a little uh, twist to what you were just saying. If you if you look at the landscape, as it were, of uh, scientists and researchers and technologists, uh, you will see, of course, uh, whites, but you will also see a lot of Asians and a lot of India Indians yeah. uh, in terms of heritage and so forth. And then, you you know, you think, where are the black uh, where are the African Americans in this mix? And that's why I love this article. It comes from interestingengineering.com. And it's uh, the headline of the article is 34 highly influential uh, African American scientists. And in my show notes, I just said, where can you learn about these guys with the link to the story and so forth and so on? And we're going to pick out just one person, but in honor of Black History Month, of course, I wanted to highlight a fascinating article, which again showcases 34 significant American, African American, pardon me, scientists. Mm -hmm. There's that wonderful movie about the uh, African-American woman who helped with the early NASA space program. I think the film's called Hidden Figures. Yep. I think that's what it's called. Yes, wonderful it movie. Folks, if you haven't seen this movie, I think it's available on Prime or Netflix. Please go watch it. It's absolutely mind-blowing. I, I, you know, of all the movies that I usually don't see, I did actually see that one. And to be able to, you know, kind of mix not just the technological challenges, but of course the the racism all in one kind of film. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was it was it was interesting from from a lot of angles. So you're right. That's yeah. a great movie. Wonderful, wonderful. And by the way, I digress one more time. Hulu has a really interesting documentary series called 1619 and why it's called that. That's the year the first uh, Africans were brought to, to the continent, you know, North America, to Virginia for enslavement. <laughs> but anyway, it's a wonderful documentary. I'm not finished with it yet, but it's pretty darn interesting and kind of an eye opener. But anyway, okay, so. Here's one example from the 34, just one, and someone whose technology most of us use every day. I certainly do. And I'm talking about a fellow named Dr. James Edward Masio. I hope I'm pronouncing that part right. It's M-A-C-E-O West, uh, who's still with us. He's 92 years old, who is an expert in physics, electronics, and acoustics. And Dr. West is best known for his work in developing the electroacoustic transducer. And you might go, okay, 
What's that? Electroacoustic transducers are called radiators or receivers depending on the direction of the conversation. They are used extensively in communications technology and sound reproduction to radiate and receive sound in ultrasonic technology to measure and receive elastic vibrations in sonar and acousto, uh, pardon me, and in acousto Uh, electronics and i give you the source for that article as well in the Mm -hmm. show notes so this compact device this this uh transducer is currently found in around 90 percent of modern microphones there you go ben you and i certainly can relate to that Uh, most telephones and other devices such as hearing aids and west studied physics at temple university graduating in 1957 remember this guy's 92 years old and was hired uh, uh, for a full-time position as an acoustical scientist at bell labs where my grandfather worked, uh, where he developed the transducer. That's where he came up with this. And West was later appointed president-elect of the Acoustical Society of America and later joined the National Academy of Engineering in 1998. And for his contributions to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, education in our country, he was also inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 1999. What an amazing guy. What an amazing character. And once again, there's 33 other fascinating characters, Black Americans, uh, in this article to go check it out in honor of uh, Black History Month. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there's, there's tons and tons of stories. I'm glad that you kind of took the time to highlight just one because it, it really wouldn't, um, you know, kind of do justice to just kind of be like, here's 29 names and just, you you know, kind of be like they're right, all important, right. and then you just list them off. I'm glad <laughs> that you decided to go with just one. So, Dr. James Edward Massio, very, very cool. Um, and yes. gentlemen, tons more out there. So, yeah, um, yeah, great segment. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's kind of it for you know for our Friday. We hope that you uh, you do something fun this weekend. We hope that you enjoyed our segment today. And Ralph, I want to thank you again for always coming on and giving us the best of the technology stories out there. Uh, you know because. Hey, you know, if you want the regular stuff, Monday through Friday, we have you. But if you want the best of the week, Ralph Bond has you every single Friday. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, thank you so much. We'll catch you here. Everyone have a good day. Bye-bye.